research this morning on, on the overdose deaths and it's kids from 16 all the way up to adults. Uh, welcome to a community conversation. My name is Jason Bannon. I'm a Wallingford resident and I'm here with Sylvester Salcedo. Uh, this is a continuation of a conversation that we, we just had. So I know we talked, you know, you were talking about Chew and, and having right. people come. And right. to me, that's a lot like the methadone, right. you know, model. And, and to me, that's like a prison sentence. I right. can't get by this clean well, heroin the, thing. Well, the clean heroin, it, it really, all it is when you think about it, right? If you went to Colombia, you could buy a pound or a kilo, 2.2 .2 pounds of pure heroin, let's say. And that's what's shipped over here. And if, if we are allowed to just go to UPS, FedEx overnight, and send that to Wallingford, Right? It probably costs us like $200 in overnight shipping. But because the, the cartels have to ship it here, uh, the original $2,000 cost for that, uh, that, that uh, package of a uh, kilo, 2.2 pounds of heroin, if it was $2,000, by the time you got here to Wallingford through the cartels, it would be $92,000 because they'd have to pay $90,000 in bribes to to various immigration and and customs official you know they might even have to kill somebody along the way so that adds another 25,000 so it's ridiculous right mm -hmm. but if you think of that concept of just shipping the one kilo of pure unadulterated heroin powdered heroin to a pharmaceutical we've got plenty of ph pharmaceutical companies here in, in in Connecticut and you convert it and again you can you can package it so that you can have the pharma pharmacist label it, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a basic level strength heroin, a medium strength, a, a higher, more potent strength. And then through doctors, they will be the ones, they will be the ones to determine what their, what their uh, clients would, would, be, would be prescribed. And it, it's not like you're doing heroin and putting it up at the shelves at uh, Stop and Shop or ShopRite, you know, it's, it's through the medical system rather than law enforcement. That was my point. And I understand that, but mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still the point of you have to pay for that heroin and then you're going to give it to people who use heroin for nothing. So where, where, Correct. Where, where, but where does it stop? So then do, do we give uh, people who are alcoholics uh, free booze? No, well, I, well, we don't have the, <laughs> the crisis. We don't have a Budweiser crisis here. Right? Well, I, I'm just I thinking, no, different I, different no, there, well, there, there is a lot of that. Well, let's, just, well, we're, let's, we're focused on, we're, I mean, I know yeah. we're focused on the opioid crisis, right. but substance was, abuse in general has right. exploded. Right. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, opioid kill people, but so does a detox from alcohol or even benzodiazepines no, no, no. or something. No, no, no. I don't yeah. deny any of those, but I, as I said, I just wanted, I was hoping in, in this sharing, con uh, this wonderful conversation with you, is just just an idea mm -hmm. of, again, keeping in sight our, our target zero so that we would have no one die of an unfortunate uh, heroin overdose incident in in the state of Connecticut yeah. for the rest of the year or forever and, and I would hope in this conversation too that we could maybe maybe chip away at the stigma and oh yeah you know, I, I'm, and, on and I'm on board I'm on board even mean, though I don't agree 100 percent right. with I, I'm I'm open to whatever I mean you know it, I, I would have said to you convince me that this is the way to go you no know, in terms mentally it's difficult to wrap your, your head around this concept of, oh, it's, it's legal heroin and it's pure, it's pharmaceutical grade, and we can get it from France or Canada or, or Switzerland. And I'm saying to myself, why can't we produce it right here? You know, under limited uh, and, again, very tightly controlled like anything else. Yeah. In the same way we're con con controlling Percocet. In the same way we're controlling methadone, actually, right? Because methadone, I mean, I know from, again, I don't have first-hand experience, but from, from, from what other people tell me, uh, narratives, is that sometimes they can be given extra dosage over the weekend when the clinic is not open. They have take-home bottles. Right, take-home bottles. So, but then again, you don't really know with this take-home bottles. You hear other stories where, well, the, the patients themselves sell it to other people who need it, because then they can take the money to buy heroin. real heroin in the right. streets. So that's what I'm saying. You know, the, 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 I, I should have pointed up to you, the $10 bag of heroin, $5 bag of heroin, $3 bag of heroin that are in the streets of anywhere, Wallingford, mm -hmm. New Haven, Bridgeport, Hartford, anywhere. That's really only really worth 10 cents, yeah. right? So think about it, a, a, $10, a $10 bag of something that's only worth 10 cents, somebody is making $9.90 in profit 
supply and demand, Sebastian. It's like no, I know that, but why would we? Why would we force our fellow Connecticut residents to purchase something for ten dollars when we know it can be offered to them at ten cents? But right now, it's an illegal substance. I know it's an illegal substance. It's an illegal substance. But it's, it's the same thing. Think back to our, our, our history in the United States. Alcohol, because of all the social problems, which were legitimate, mm -hmm. right? You had all these ladies, these, these uh, uh, the ladies who, 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 who um, lobbied Congress and said, listen, alcohol is devastating our society. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of these immigrant uh, uh, workers come in, and they'd have 18 children per family, work like a dog in a factory. And then on their way home with their salary, they'd stop by every saloon. And by the time they got home, they have, you know, 10 cents in their pocket. And you have 18 hungry children to feed. And that's why we made alcohol illegal in this country. But yet we went through another painful phase where you basically had prohibition and people abused it. You had the speakeasies. People really, you know, it's just generally in our societal culture that people will just basically look the other way and money will be made and that's how you get uh, all the all the criminal organizations develop al capone right because people still wanted it and they would do it in secret so then when you went the, the pendulum swung the other way again and you abolish prohibition now you don't see the beer be uh, budweiser delivery truck driving around wallingford making his deliveries with an ak-47 and you know on, on his passenger seat because Beer is regulated, and and and, and it's a, it's for a price that's affordable, relatively for people, right? And when there's a higher supply, Super Bowl time, mm -hmm. you know the the beer factories will produce more beers to meet the demand. But in gen, and then of course yes, you do have the DUIs, you have the car accidents, but you do also have a wraparound education reminders don't drink and drive and even societal mothers against drunk driving they're, they're reacting to a particular set of societal issues that need to be addressed and these are all legitimate but the key is you know we want to know you and i were initially starting this conversation about target zero mm -hmm. you know how do we get connecticut to have zero uh heroin overdose or opioid related overdose deaths and to me, as I said, this is just one way to do it. If you look at the amount of money that's being spent versus the amount of money that could be saved and also making it healthier. Because as I said, if the Yale doctors are right, and it's about 105,000 Connecticut uh, residents are affected by opioids, either in recovery, completely sober, or still actively using. Whether we use 33,000 as our starting um, point of people who are it's still using it let's get those 33,000 out of their secret lives go to folks like you go to you know there are 10,000 members of the American, uh, the Connecticut Bar Association right if there are 33,000 uh, opioid users I propose to the president of the Connecticut Bar Association and say why don't we have every lawyer in Connecticut take on three pro bono clients mm -hmm. three of these opioid dependent uh, persons individuals in whatever town you're in, they say, as part of my give back to, to the society, to Connecticut society as a, an attorney, I will be the uh, basically attorney for these three individuals, and you guide them through this whole system, and you provide them with uh, you know connection through through the, through the network counselors, and the key is to keep them alive, and to keep them away from engaging in crime. But of course, we would have to change. Like we would almost practically have the same laws that we have for the casinos, right? It, it would be like Connecticut would be a uh, a, a drug tolerant zone uh -huh. in the United States of America, and we could just try that out, like prohibition. Let's try it out for a year. Let's try it out for three years, and see how it works. Well, uh, you know, I'm more of a, a, a prevention, education, treatment guy but i'm open to Agreed. a lot of a lot of different i agree things. But, but but see that yeah go ahead there, yeah. There, there's you know there's uh there's a lot of people who it's it's very difficult for them to get sober and they want to get sober or clean or in recovery okay. and and what you're what you're proposing um is kind of to, to me it's kind of against that because you're still gonna you're still you're still gonna provide them with heroin and and society is is not you know as a whole are not going to get behind that 
No, just say I, no. I don't. I don't think we should lose the point. I'm not saying that all 100,000 of these opioid affected individuals that were identified by the doctors from mm -hmm. Yale School of Public Health and, and, and Yale Medical School. I'm not saying let them have this sort of open plate and just say, hey, come help yourself. No. Okay. What we're doing is, as I said, go to the individual yeah. and ask them in a nice, welcoming, you know, very friendly tone. It's not like, oh, you want to get well, right? You know, we want to say, hey, let's, let's talk to you in, in, the, in the most open, non-threatening, non-judgmental way. Just say, hey, in an ideal world, what would you really like to do? To just just stabilize yourself, so you're not, you're not stealing, you're not prostituting yourself, you're not lying to your mom or your girlfriend or your wife or you know what I mean. Just what will it take? And if they say, I really want rehab, well then that's what we will try. To, instead of wasting money on buying Narcan for every every uh, you know first responder in Connecticut, take that. Narcan money of Governor Malloy and put it towards this program. I, I don't see Narcan as a waste of money either. I actually have five doses in my car right now because you just never know. Okay. They're going to need more of that. So from like a dollars and cents point, I know you're not a big proponent, you're not against it, but mm -hmm. not a big proponent of, you know, like Governor Malloy r rolling out the Narcan right, uh, to right. all the, the EMTs and right. the paramedics and, right. and police and fire departments and all that. Right. But to me, it's kind of like a fire extinguisher. I'd rather have it and not have to use it than right. eat it and not have it. Um, and yes, the price has gone up because it's supply and demand. This is America, right. supply and demand. So well, the price has gone up. I hear the point you made. Like a, I, I understand. I mean, I, I could bring 100 Narcans in my briefcase around, but you know, the chances of me really realistically running into somebody who, who will have an overdose mm -hmm. is almost none, really. And, and, and I... I'm the PTO president of the John C. Daniels School in New Haven, where across the street right. is APT Foundation, one of the largest methadone clinics mm -hmm. in all of uh, New Haven. And in fact, we've had incidents where we've had some of their clients uh, basically collapse in, on our school grounds. Mm -hmm. But I'm not there, right? right? And, and, and even though they come every morning and they, our, kid, our, our school children and our staff see them, uh, Again, their lives really is, is, is almost not interconnected to our lives as, as an elementary school. And yet we, we're across, from each, across the street from each other. So to me, again, as I said, wouldn't it be better, your, your five dose of Narcans that you have on you right now as you're driving around, wouldn't, wouldn't those be more effective if they were positioned in a clinic where the 33,000 active users of opioids and heroin today go every morning and every afternoon to have a dose of what they need to stabilize, not, not to be party animals, but just so that they don't, what they call dope sick, right? Because I think from what I hear in, 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 this, uh, in this population, what they, you know, after the partying phase is over, what they really dislike the most is the sensation right. of, of the withdrawal symptoms. Yes, back right. pain. Exactly. All the, all the withdrawal symptoms, exactly. which is absolutely horrific correct and that's what and that's what drives them to get the, the 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 heroin and that's what drives them to do anything to commit crimes to sell their children to do you know what i mean to, mm -hmm. to 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 violate every societal norm right and that's why i'm saying that's the point where i would like to meet them or you know the chew philosophy outlook would like to meet them and say hey you don't have to engage in criminality you don't have to abandon your children you don't have to steal grandma's social security check what you have to do is just sign up with the Connecticut Heroin Users Union. We will embrace you with tolerance, empathy, and acceptance. And again, we're not saying take heroin for the rest of your life. That's 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 ridiculous. That's a that's a that that's not a desirable uh, philosophy. Really, it what it is is we want to keep an eye on target zero. We want you not to be dead tomorrow or next week or by the end of this year. And, and what I'm hearing you say too is, is it's a kind of treatment, but I, I don't know any other thing that we treat with the same substance that is killing a person. I mean, I'm not a pharmacologist or a physician, but I don't think it's the heroin that kills them, but I think what kills them is the pressure, the, the sort of criminality around having to take it. But as I said, I mean, I, I have these attorney friends who, who, who have to take insulin, right? So they run around the courthouse, they have a special bag mm -hmm. with the syringes. Sometimes we have dinner together and 
you know, they, they just do their shot right there before dessert comes. And nobody thinks anything because you know that person needs insulin right. and it's a quick shot and it's all done, uh, you know, in, in a very clinical way. And they have all the, the w proper ways to dispose or, or restore their syringes and, and use needles. And it's not just sort of thrown on the, on the sidewalk after yeah. they use it. That's sort of the same concept, I believe, again, in, in practice, I watch two areas, the safe injection room in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, one in Amsterdam, and then the one up in um, Vancouver in Canada. And to me, you go through that walking through and talking to the staff, it's just an amazing, you know, when I went to see this first safe injection room in, in Germany, I asked this young 25 year old something German social worker. And I said, I said, Fräulein Schmidt, you know, <laughs> American. I said, my first question was, well, how many people have you lost to over an overdose death? And she looked at me like I was crazy. She goes, nine, nine. He says, never. And that's not to say they won't have two, sometimes four overdose incidents per day right. in that clinic. But yet nobody dies because they don't have to grab a $94 Narcan mm -hmm. dose. Or if you and I buy it, I think it's now $174 a dose. They grab a $2 plastic breathing tube from the wall. They lay the guy down or the woman down in the middle of the floor. They stick the breathing tube and they artificial breathe because basically, I never knew this, but they explained it to me. When you hit the overdose um, level, the heroin basically makes your lung muscles just so relax mm -hmm. that they just go to sleep and not breathe for you. So you're not getting oxygen to your brain and you turn blue. And in the United States of America, everybody panics and runs away. Mm -hmm. Whereas over there, they just very calmly, methodically, just say, okay, this guy hit the overdose zone, and they grab that tube, and they just artificial. And in 30, 40 seconds, the guy's, you know, eyelids start to flutter, and, and then he says, oh, you know, I screwed up. I, I over, you know, got over, well, because they never know yeah. how, how potent the, that the street heroin get that they got that morning, whether it's stronger than yesterday's dose that they bought, they never know. So that's why they're prepared and there's a protocol and it's safe and it's clean and you know you don't spread diseases and most of all the whole frankfurt society from the police i mean the police they drive around there and they see somebody at the train station who looks like they just came out of from out of town and they look scraggly they go up to the guy and they say do you need help and if it's heroin they put the guy in the back seat nice and warm drive him to the clinic and say, go talk to Fraulein Schmidt over there. And if you haven't eaten, they'll give you food. If you if your clothes haven't been clean, there's a washing machine in the basement. If you haven't had a nap, you know, take a shower and go take a, a warm nap before you come back down and we'll talk to you. I mean, totally different. And here, you get grabbed by the police, they stomp on your neck and say, you know, isn't this like the 15th time we've arrested you this summer, right? Okay. It's a totally different approach. So anyway, Unfor that's all I'm saying. Unfortunately, I know some people that got sober that way. By, well, by going to prison, and, I'm, and no, listen, no, I, 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 understand I don't think that, that every, everybody who uses a substance should go to prison and, and rot in jail because right. that's not, that's not, right. that's not the way it you should be. You hear that, but you see, here's the thing. If you look at the statistics, it's only 10% of people are fortunate enough to recover and kick the habit. What happens when that dark moment comes back again? Who's there for you? Yeah. And well, I want to, that's why I want to say, we want you to be able to be there for you. If you if you trace back each of these stories of all these individuals with whom you've had a, an encounter with, you know, I could almost, we, if we mapped it out on a piece of paper, we could point out each point where they could have had a chance if they were on a uh, situation like the chew. Because we cheer the 10% who, 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 who do well, right? When, yeah. Who are the success stories? We put them on TV. We, we write them up on newspapers, but what happens to the other ninety percent? Just like I think, one of the things too is is communities, and you're talking about you know society as a whole. Uh -huh. We kind of like look down on people who have a substance abuse problem yeah. or whatever, and, and a lot of people don't even view it as a disease, but it is a disease. It's a disease of the brain. The medical uh, association says it is, and you know one of the things that I, I would hope for is support from communities, and one of the things that. Um, that subcommittee that I'm on yeah. is trying to work with um, recovery friendly communities because once you're in that yeah. recovery phase whether yeah. it be two months two days two years yeah. whatever it is 
uh, there, there, there needs to be friendly yeah. resources. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of smiling as as you're bringing up that that whole committee is because you know for for the, this last four years that I've been kind of you know running around with it just uh, um, family uh, gatherings or, mm-hmm. or people I meet uh, in 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 bar association meetings or something like that is that in Hartford nobody or I shouldn't say nobody but I said I put it this way most people up in Hartford have been reluctant to invite me to any of these open discussions about the opioid crisis in Connecticut Mm -hmm. because it seems to me that they don't ever want to hear this idea of the chew being introduced in other words the the T the tolerance the empathy and acceptance I don't think they have a problem with that I think they have a problem with supplying heroin users with heroin I'm going well, to be honest with you. No, that's okay, fine. If 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 if, the, if that's the sticking point, mm-hmm. at least at least, however, how about opening the dialogue to saying, uh, well, look at this one, you know, uh, this chief of police up in in Massachusetts, uh, I think the the, the sample, um, what's his name, Italian guy, um, Chief Campanello, yeah. right? He he, I mean, the opioid situation up in 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 the Cape Cod there has gotten so bad that he's told all his officers not to arrest anybody who comes to them with all their paraphernalia and, and right. admit that they're heroin addicted. Mm-hmm. So what they would do is they would bring him into the police station, they would take all their needles and all their whatever they have and just basically destroy it and get rid of it. And then they help this person go through a rehab. They'll match him to, a re- mm-hmm. again, a recovery bed. We have something right? like that in Connecticut, in Manchester, called Project Hope. Correct. And actually, there's another town up there. I don't know if it's Windsor Locks or, or Suffield, an, another town there. Actually, I thought uh, New London would, would get ahead of everybody. But yes, the chief up in Manchester. Yeah. But see, here, here's the sticking point to that still, though, is, okay, let's say, you know, Manchester, let's say all 30 active heroin users up in Manchester go up to the chief this mm-hmm. afternoon and say, Chief, we're addicted to heroin, we're turning ourselves into you. Mm-hmm. Would the chief be able to have 30 beds ready for them? Well, it's not and him ch- getting the beds, and that's that's part of what I, I but, said in the last, but, last right, thing but see, about the, the beds being full and you correct. can't Correct, but and so this is, this is where I feel that the chew can be sort of a, can meet them where they are, and mm-hmm. that until a bed opens up, if they are sincere about getting clean, right? Mm-hmm. If of the 30... How they, are you going to measure their sincerity? Well, it's really up to them. Okay. But but what it is, is when you have the 30 of them lined up, and the chief will say, okay, let's call uh, Joe and Jane and, and Mary over there at these... At these uh, at these rehab centers and they'll say oh we only we can only find a total of five beds today mm-hmm. so the other 25 what do you do with them they go back out in the streets and that's where I say the Chew should step in and say while you're waiting you can you can ingest heroin instead of going out in the streets you come to us until they can find a bed and then you go that's all I'm saying so that you don't die of an overdose in the bathroom at some donut shop somewhere. Yeah, and nobody wants that. Nobody, Correct. Nobody That's what I'm saying. That. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm asking. But I, I, I would I would say it would be more of a, a medication assisted treatment at that point. Whatever it is that they want. And mm-hmm. as I said, I'm not I'm not saying that it has to be heroin. As I said, go back to the question. You ask the person what is it that will make you stable today? Suboxone, methadone, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And if it and if you say heroin, then that's on the menu of choices. That's all I'm saying. So I think we're running out of time, and it's <laughs> it's like <laughs> I told you we could talk about. We, this uh, yes, I agree. Agreed. Agreed. Just sitting here with you and having this ex- exchange to me is is already a, a move forward for us two individuals who may not necessarily see this the same way. And uh, I certainly will 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 think over some of uh, your your experiences that you've shared with me. It's always an enriching uh, experience to, to be able to engage somebody in a, in a very nice dialogue. Sylvester, thank you very much. Right, thank you, Jay. That is it's great. It's and thank great, you to Wallingford for being so welcoming. Yes, uh, and uh, thank you for coming to Wallingford to talk about it today. And thank you all out there for joining us in a community conversation.